thanks everyone for joining. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, uh, tech challenge as in challenge with understanding protobuf or, or challenge with understanding, uh, trying to get the, the, the microphone working. Um, hello, Roberto and, and Raj. Good to see you. Okay. Um, hello, Will. Good to see you. Uh, can't quite tell how many people are here, but i um, kind of excited for this. Uh, so for some context, uh, I've been working on um, a little horse for about two years. Uh, and uh, the last, the current version, which is the one that we're actually going to take into production and sell and, and, and stuff is uh, based entirely on protobuf. And, and we've been working on that one for uh, this version with this architecture based on protocol buffers for almost 18 months. So for almost 18 months, I have been deep into uh, the ins and outs of protocol buffers. And it's actually a really, really nice, really cool technology that has all sorts of applications and is incredibly relevant to uh, uh, many people in, in um, many different places. You know, it's 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 the core of Little Horse, but it, you know, even if you don't ever use Little Horse, it's it's a good technology to know because it's a great way to have high performance uh, serialization um, and uh, high performance um, in, in API uh, compatibility and, and, and schema management. Um, so today we're just going to talk a little bit about you know how does protobuf work, what is it. Um, compare it to JSON and I'll uh, go through a couple fun live demos that show you how it's faster than JSON and also some of the implications of changing the schema and uh, how to um, how to get um, uh, how to be how to be able to evolve your data structures without breaking any existing services or any new services. Uh, so it's, it's basically nine now so I think we can start. Um, you know, I, I can see comments. So if you have any questions at any point, because there's going to be a lot of content and I think it should take about 40, 40 minutes or so. If there's any questions at any point, uh, uh, put something in the comments and I will, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to answer. Um, try to make this uh, somewhat interactive. Uh, you know, I might have to have my team members come and answer some questions if they get a little, a little complicated. Um, but uh, all right, I think I'll, I'll start. So um one second quick share screen uh here we go okay so um i think we'll we'll start out with uh a, a just brief overview of what protocol buffers are and and how they're different from json how to use them um going to go into a deep dive of the wire format and how protocol buffers take a a programming like a java object or a golang struct and serialize it into a bunch of bytes that can be written over the wire um we're going to talk about how that actually works and that's very important when you try to understand uh things uh and best practices of how to use protobuf to uh ensure that when you change your data format you don't break old clients and you also allow new clients to add new information to your uh, data schema without breaking anything. Uh, so first, protocol buffer is a data serialization format. Uh, and basically what that is, is if you have a, a Java object or Golang struct or Python object or something that has some information, uh, in this example, we're going to be talking about a car. So you have a representation of a car, which has a make, a model, and a year or something. And you want to save that representation onto disk, or you want to send it over the network so that some computer somewhere else can take that data and do something with it. You need to convert that Java object into a bunch of bytes that can be written down on uh, a disk or over the network and read by something else. Uh, the only thing that protocol buffers is, is uh, a method uh, and a protocol for serializing uh, data structures into uh, uh, bytes that can be written over the internet. So uh, most of you, if you're software engineers, and I think everyone on this call is, is software engineer, understand what JSON is. It's a human readable serialization method. Um, and it's great because it's easy to use. Uh, there are some problems with it, um, especially around performance and uh, schema evolution. And protobuf solves those two problems quite nicely. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how that works. But first, there's a, a fun demo I'd like to show you guys. Um, about why uh, protobuf is so cool. So um, 
of course, we're opening a terminal because I don't like PowerPoint. Um, I have a representation of a car, um, which is a, you know, as I said before, make, model, and year, right? Uh, so I have uh, created a file with, uh, I think it was 100,000 cars in it um, in JSON. And I'll show you this file, just so you believe me. It's There's 100,000 representations of, of different cars with this data schema. Um, and I have also represented that car in, in protocol buffers. Or I have also represented the same set of 100,000 cars in protocol buffers uh, in um, a cars.pv file. So um, I told you before, JSON is human readable. And if, if we go um, to here, you can kind of read the data. So for example, here is a car that is, uh, you know, uh, from 2019, model is model 83 and make is make 83. Not very inventive, but you can see, you can understand the data by looking at it, right? Um, uh, if we go to look at the protobuf, however, one drawback of protocol buffers is that it's not actually human readable, the serialized format. Um, but I think hopefully uh, throughout the course of this presentation, I'll convince you that the benefits of protocol buffers significantly outweigh this one drawback. See, if I try to look at this, this file, it says it's a binary file. Do you want to see it anyways? Yes. And this is the, the representation. It's You can kind of see some sort of stuff, a lot of stuff you can't really see. It's just a big mess. Uh, so you lose the ability to look at the data and read it as a human. However, here's a cool fun thing, a fun, cool thing is the representations are different sizes because protobuf is more efficient. Um, if you look here, uh, the JSON representation is, is 5.2 megabytes and the protobuf representation is 2.7 megabytes. So already we're basically having the cutting in half the disk disk usage. And for this example, um, it, it, the, the savings are actually a lot less than what you can get in some other uh, data format. So for example, in Little Horse, when I rewrote it to use protobuf instead of JSON, it wasn't a, a 2x improvement. It was more of a 5x improvement in terms of uh, how much disk space everything used. Um, so first uh, thing to, to note is that using protobuf is an incredibly efficient way of serializing data in terms of, in, in terms of space. So um, this is the, you know, the, the Java representation of, of the, the car in, in JSON. Uh, I'll show you the protocol buffer representation. Very similar. Uh, we have um, uh, basically in, in protocol buffers, uh, the way to use it is first you define your data schema, which is what you see in this file. Let me make it bigger so you can actually see. Um, it, it's, uh, this is the schema for a car. This is called the protocol buffer definition. And, and we can see that the car has three fields. It has a make, a model, and a year. And the next step is you tell protocol buffer to compile the schema into Java objects that understand it and, and can serialize a Java object into to, to wire bytes. So there is a script I wrote. Whoop. Um, yeah, there, there's a script that uses the uh, proto C uh, uh, binary, which comes from protocol buffers. I don't want to go too deep into this because ChatGPT can do it for you. So I don't want to spend too much time on it, on how, how to actually compile the, the protocol buffers. But I just have a script that does it. And if I run that script, um, you will see that it creates uh, a bunch of um, it creates a bunch of Java files that all understand um, th this is auto-generated code created by the protocol buffer compiler uh, that understands the car object. And you can interact with the car object and create car objects using this Java class. And then the Java class understands the protocol buffer protocol and can write the car into uh, a series of bytes that are written on disk and can be read by other protobuf clients. Uh, and the cool thing about protocol buffers is that if you don't like Java, which you know everyone here hopefully does like Java, but if you don't like Java, it, it is compatible with you know 12, 13, I think it's 13 different languages have protobuf compilers for them. So you can write a car in Java, throw it over the network, and then read it in a Python application, and then change it, and then throw it over the network and read it in .NET, for example. Um, and the the, basically, you take this file, this, this protocol buffer definition, uh, and you can generate clients in any, any language very, very easily. Um, okay, so what was I going to do next? So to, to recap, um, uh, the, the comparison versus JSON, uh, where JSON is that first representation we looked at, uh, much more efficient in terms of space, way faster. Oh, uh, there's one more thing I wanted to show you. 
um, I wanted to show you the, the speed of deserialization. So I, I showed you that I wrote out those two files, um, the 100,000 cars in JSON and 100,000 cars in protobuf. And I have uh, two uh, methods, one which reads all of the JSON cars and another which reads all of the protobuf uh, cars. And we we're going to see how long it takes to do each of them. Um, and my hypothesis is that you, reading protobuf is a lot faster than JSON. So um, if we run this, uh, it should say how long it took. So deserializing the protobuf took 65 milliseconds and JSON took uh, 181. Let's run it again and see what happens. Um, roughly three times faster. And as I said before, this example, the savings are a lot less than what you get in other ones because this is a very simple example. And for more complex data structures, protobuf is way faster than JSON. So we, we get like a, a 2x at minimum uh, space savings, 3x uh, uh, performance and uh, improvement in reading. So if we go back to the comparison, you know, more efficient in terms of space, faster to read and write from Java object to disk and from disk to Java object. And then, you know, as a drawback, it's not human readable, but we also get automatic code generation, which makes it very easy to, to work with uh, uh, protobuf. Um, you know, in, in the field. Um, so um, let me uh, go now to the uh, wire format. This part is going to be very deep, very technical. Uh, so, you know, if, if you want to take a nap, now is the time. Uh, but hopefully it should be no more than like five, maybe eight minutes, and then we can go to some cool demos. But um, if you want to understand why the, the demos and, and the rules I'm going to talk about for how to change your protobuf structure and contract without breaking any existing code, you need to understand the wire format first. So the first thing to note is that in protocol buffers, fields are assigned a number. And a field is, if we go back here uh, to the, the car, a field is, you know, this is a field, uh, that's a field, and that's a field, right? You can see each field is assigned a number. That's the first important thing to note. Um, and then with uh, the protocol buffer, when you write that car object, that Java object into protocol buffers, um, it's encoded in a very specific format. Uh, and first you uh, protocol buffer encodes the field number, next is the wire type, and third is the value. So the wire type is a protocol buffer internal thing. Uh, generally the most common two are var ints and then variable length uh, byte strings. That's not terribly important. Uh, I, I think you can ignore that detail, but basically you just need to remember that protocol buffer will write down uh, the field number first and then the value generally. So um, yeah, length limited fields have length right after the tag. Sub messages are, are len fields. So that's um, more, more advanced, probably won't get to it today. I don't think we'll have enough time. Now, interesting thing is that um, we're going to get into the difference between null and zero in in, uh, in in protobuf. So originally protocol buffers didn't really have a sense of zero because they came from uh, Golang. Uh, well, they, they came from um, the same group of people who wrote Golang is, is the same people who wrote the first protocol buffer version. And in, in Golang, there is no uh, concept of null, uh, or at least not, uh, there, there, there is, they have pointers, but the null is not a first class citizen. So um, originally, protocol buffers didn't have the, the concept of, of null, so um, they um, uh, used uh, uh, the concept of zero. So, for example, the zero value of a string is just the empty string. The zero value of an integer is zero. The zero value of a Boolean is false. Um, and if I go here, right, uh, a, a car can sometimes potentially have an owner, right? So. Um, I can add another field called uh, owner and and maybe there's an owner, maybe there isn't. So uh, if if the car I if the car has an owner, uh, then I would I would set the owner when I'm building the car. Um, you know, I, here here I'm building a car, right? I would do um, you know uh, Bob. Let's say Bob owns the car, right? I would add that I would add that field. So if this were the case, then the the protocol buffer representation in in bytes would contain the field number four with with the owner set to Bob. However, if I don't do this, uh, even though there is the field in the definition, there is no serialization. Uh, the the field number four does not show up in the serialized car. That's important to know. 
uh, when we get into optionals and one ofs, uh, which we might not have time for today. But it's important to know that if you have a really, really massive, you know, um, protocol buffer, you know, with with hundreds of lines of, of fields and stuff, and you only set two or three of the fields, it's incredibly efficient because the only two or three of the fields, the ones that you set, will show up in the wire representation. Um, and we use that actually quite extensively at Little Horse. Uh, we have some massive protobufs that are used internally by our server, and they have you know 30 or 40 fields, and only one or two are set at any given time. And that's very important because now we're only sending the data that we actually need, uh, and it, it's very efficient. Uh, back when we used JSON, it was a big, big mess. We didn't want that. Um, so um, here, let's do a. a you know, only three more minutes on, on the, the wire format, and then we can go into, uh, I'll, I'll pause for some questions because I bet there will be some, and I'll go into some some hands-on demos of uh, printing out, um, you know, uh, of changing the format, reading the reading reading old values with new schemas and, and what happens. So let's say that we have a, a foo message, right? Because every, every computer programming lecture has to have foo, right? As two fields, in 32 bar and string boss, right? This is our object that we want to encode. This is the JSON representation of it. Uh, so it's human readable, bar is set to 137. If you're a physicist, you know what that means. Um, and boss is set to hello there. If you're a Star Wars fan, you know what that means. So here's how protocol buffer will encode it. It basically says field one is var int 137 and var int basically is an integer uh, that can is a number basically that can take a variable number of bytes so smaller values take fewer bytes larger values take more bytes which is very efficient so if you want to serialize you know small numbers like five six seven eight those only take like one byte but if you want to do a, a massive number like you know 10 quadrillion uh, it will uh, use many more bytes to, to represent it um, so first you know uh, the field number for bar is one. So we see one colon this, and then there's the value 137. Field number or for boss is two. So we see two colon len here. And then 13 is the length of the string uh, because len is a variable length byte dump, right? And here is the hex dump of the string, hello there. Um, that's the hex dump of it. Now, I, I, I represented this in ASCII so that you could actually see it. In, in real life, it's written in, in like, uh, a much more compact ones and zeros. And this is just an enum, not actually a string. Uh, there's no colons, it's just length delimited. So the real representation is actually more compact, but this is conceptually what's going on. Um, I'll give you another, oh, did I, oh, here it is. Okay, here's another example. Um, so in the, oh, goodness gracious. Um, in the past we had in 32 and, and then string, uh, what if we have, string bar and then repeated in 32 boss is, is two. So uh, this is another protocol buffer definition. You can have what's called a repeated field, which is basically just a list. And uh, one important thing to note is that order is respected in repeated fields. Um, if So it, it's basically like a JSON list. In JSON lists, uh, order is respected, which is very important. Um, so here's the object we want to serialize. Bar is set to hello there, that same string. And then boss is one, two, three, four. The way it's encoded is field one, that's bar, right? That's the string and it's encoded the same way it was last time. Now there's four values in this list in the repeated in 32. So we say, and that field number is two. So two colon var int, first value is one, second value is two, third value is three and fourth value is four. So we have four entries for field number two. Um, and there's an optimization in, in more recent versions of protobuf uh, that make this a little bit, it, it's a little bit different in, in the more recent versions, uh, not terribly important to understand it because it doesn't actually change how the serialization, how the schema evolution works. But if you just understand this, you should be able to understand the implications of changing from, for example, a, a regular uh, string to a repeated string and, and so on. Um, well, quick reminder, I don't really I, I, I don't really want to write Go code live because my Golang is kind of shoddy. So but uh, the, the point is you can easily write uh, an object in, in Java into protobuf and then read it in Go or Python or any other uh, thing. We'll get there soon. Um, and now uh, I haven't seen any questions in the comments. So if you have uh, if you have questions, please post them. I will try to answer. Um, but I'd like to uh, give you a quick demo of some uh, fun schema evolution things that you can do uh, with protobuf. So first, uh, in contrast to JSON, you can rename fields. 
remember that we, uh, when you go back here, we never, re you, you never see, you know, bar or boss or something in the uh, serialization. You only see the field numbers, which means you don't actually need to worry about changing the names of the field. Changing the field numbers, however, is not safe. So let's go take an example of this. Um, so I have, uh, here I have a, a, a car object. Um, and let's just say that I want to have a, a version two of the car where I change some field. Um, and instead of calling it a make, I want to call it brand, right? So uh, let me compile the protobuf. Uh, so now I have, you see, this is a new file, the car v2. Uh, it's, it's a new file that just came up uh, because I just created the, 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 new, the new struct and then um, compiled it. And now I have created a, a first car, um, which has the make model in year, and I'm going to write it into a string of bytes. Now, what I want to do next is I want to uh, read this bytes into a car v2 object. So basically I'm simulating that we have written some data onto a database or onto disk, changed our schema, recompiled it, and then we want to read that old data, right? I, I'm not gonna actually write it to disk, we're just going to pass it and read it with a new object. So let me read it into a, a car v2. All right, so now I have the new car and we're going to check that the brand should be equal to Ford. All right, so hopefully if everything goes right, it should be Ford. Um, make this, um, oh, let me make this bigger. Um, and I'm gonna run the code and we get new brand is Ford. Now, what happens if if I go back to the protobuf and you know make it make it the same, right? And I change the field number for make from one to uh, to four, right? Um, this is actually quite interesting, and it's going to demonstrate a few interesting concepts. So, I compile the proto again. Now the code doesn't work because there's no longer a get brand. Uh, now it's called make again. Um, I'm just going back to make to be very sure that we're only changing the field number. So we're going to serialize a, a car um, with the first format, and then we're going to read it with the new format. The only thing that changed between the field formats is the field number. So now uh, this car is going to serialize field number one, two, and three. It's not gonna serialize field number four because there is no field number four. When we try to read make, uh, one of two things is going to happen. There's either going to be null or zero, or three things, null, zero, or error, because it's not set. Uh, let's um, put a period at the end so we can see. Um, all right, so if we run the code, um, compile the proto and run the code. Um, the new make is empty string. So that teaches us something about how protocol buff, uh, wait, um, how protocol buff uh, works um, in, uh, in terms of uh, handling zero values. Um, so, uh, what that means is that if there is a field that is not set in the byte representation and you read it, it defaults to zero. And zero is different depending on the, the, the type you're talking about. As I said before, a Boolean is false and a number is zero. Any form of number is a zero. Um, bytes, a, a list of bytes, you can have a, a series of bytes that have no structure, that is just an empty array. And um, a, uh, a string is just the empty string. Uh, so that is the first thing I wanted to show, which is that changing the field number does break stuff. Um, and um, uh, any any questions so far? I don't no questions there. Um, and note on adding fields. Okay, um, I think. Um, wait, are there comments on LinkedIn? I, I see uh, comments on the Streamyard, but I don't think all of them are showing up. Okay, no no questions so far. Cool. Um, so, um, you know, you can, you can add fields uh, to protobuf. Like sometimes, you, you know, um, if I have uh, a car, right, and now I want to add a, a new field to it, for example, in, instead of just keeping track of make, model, and year, I also want to keep track of color, right? What happens here if I write a car like this and then I read it with the new format and I try to get the color? Uh, it should be very similar to, oh, I need to compile a protobuf again. Um, it, it should be uh, similar to uh, what happened before, where it, it, it shows up as empty. 
Um, so if I run, run the code, uh, the new color, well, not, I should say new color. Uh, the new color should be empty because we didn't set it on the first one uh, and we, we did try to read it on the second. So it is empty. Uh, so adding fields is safe. So long as you understand that old data that doesn't have that field set will give you empty. Um, now, I, I would like to show you a cool protocol buffer uh, feature called optional, um, which I, I mentioned earlier, didn't actually tell you how it works. Um, what's, what's next here? Uh, changing to repeated. Okay. Um, so uh, optional is a, a fun um, uh, a fun thing that that basically, as I said, um, protocol buffers does not serialize a zero field. So if the field is set to zero, it won't send it over the wire. But that doesn't let you distinguish between, you know, I set the value to zero or I wanted to set it to null. Optional is a new feature in Proto Proto three that was you know added a couple of years ago that lets you do that uh, by distinguishing between things that are set and things that are not set. So uh, let's just say um, uh, string color uh, equals four, right? So I'm, I'm going to add uh, optional color to both of these. Um, it's, we're not really gonna do anything about scheme evolution here, but uh, I'll just show you how optional works. Um, so if I have this, I'll set the color here. Uh, to a, a silver, to silver, right? Uh, and we should see that um, the color comes out to silver uh, because I have set the, the silver on the card before we write it. Uh, I set the color on the card before we write it. And here I'm going to read the color from that, uh, that car that was just written. So we would expect to see silver printed out. Um, nothing surprising here. But the, the interesting um, thing to note is there is a new method on the car object called has color. Oh. Typing very poorly today. Um, so there's this new method on the car called has color, which is a Boolean, which tells you whether the color was set. So because we set it here, the color should be, the has color should return true. Now, if we run this, we should see um, has color is true. Now, here's the interesting thing. Uh, what happens if we comment this line out? So we are no longer setting the color on the original car. Um, we would expect that, you know, has color is false, but what about new color? Do we get null or do we get empty string? Or do we get error? Well, we get, no, we didn't, we didn't set the color, but when we ask for it, we get empty string. So that's uh, dependent on the language, depending on the language you're using, uh, protobuf does that a little bit differently. So you need to be careful. For example, in, in Golang, uh, there isn't a has color and get color method, rather they give you a color pointer. So you need to check if that, that pointer is nil. Um, so you really need to look at the, the docs for the language you're using. Uh, Python does it a little bit differently. I think Saul can tell you about that uh, in, a, in a future talk. Um, but the the important thing to note is is that uh, you can um, uh, you can inspect for whether a, a field is present or not uh, by using the has color method. So um, if I go back to here, um, changing field to repeatable. Okay, next thing is changing a field to repeated. So uh, let's go back to our car. Um, and for now, you know, let's just say a car has four attributes. It has a make, model, year, and owner. Right, uh, and we'll go back here, um, right? So we have uh, one owner right now. So now what if we wanted to um, change the, the data structure and suddenly we, we realize, oh wait, cars can actually have more than one owner, not just one, right? Um, so in that case, in the new version of the car, we don't want just string owner, we want repeated string owners. Right. In this case, we've gone from cars can only have one owner to now they have multiple owners. So, for example, if you know there's a family and, and there's two people who who uh, sign the title or something. So let's compile this, and I'll show you a fun demo about that. And it, it's actually a really really nice feature of um, of uh, Protobuf, uh, which is that you can easily change from a single field to a repeated field. Uh, set owner um, Obi Wan, 
And then um, we're going to uh, print out the owners. So we added this owners uh, field and in Java uh, that creates a new method on the car v2 object called get owners list, uh, which returns a uh, protocol string list, which is inherits, it inherits the, the Java list method or not, uh, that was not English. It inherits the Java list class and implements, sorry, it implements the Java list interface. I know Edward would get very mad at me for getting that wrong. Um, <laughs> he's our, our, our resident Java expert at Little Horse. Um, okay, so what, we're, what is going to happen here? We set one owner on the first car, and in that car, in that data schema, there is only a singular field for owner. So we set it there, and now we're trying to read it with the new version, where now we go, oh, shoot, we can't just have one owner. Now we need multiple. So what's going to happen? Uh, compile, uh, run it. Now the owners is actually a list. And that list contains that one value we set before, which is really, really nice. It's a very, very nice feature. And, and we use that at Little Horse to be able to safely add new features and, and new types of storing data in internally without breaking compatibility with old clients or old data that was written on disk. Because at Little Horse, you know, we, we take API compatible compatibility very seriously because if you know we we don't want to um, update little horse from version one to version two and force our customers to rewrite their code or break something because now the data is written in a format that little horse can't read it anymore. So we, we take uh, compatibility and schema evolution very seriously. And, and this is a, a tool that we use quite extensively, uh, the ability to change from a single field to a repeated field. Um, so that, that was, that, that's a very important thing to, to note. But how does it work? If, if we remember here, um, where is it here? Yes. The way that repeated fields are actually serialized is multiple values for uh, the uh, multiple entries for the field that is repeated. So in the first case, if you uh, rem if we remember the 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 car with only a singular owner, it was serialized something like this with only one entry for uh, the field number four, which is the owner. However, if we make it a repeated field, it would look something like this with multiple. But if we have a repeated field with one element, it looks exactly like this, which is exactly the same as having a singular owner. In that way, you can take data that was written with a singular field and read it into a repeated field, and it will work exactly as expected. That's a very cool thing that that should be uh, remembered and, and, and noted. Um, think, you know, don't want to go too much over time, but there's one more thing I wanted to do, uh, which is, oh, we already talked about making a field optional. What about making a field non-optional? Um, this is one last thing I want to, want to talk about in terms of compatibility and evolution. Um, the, if we go back to here, we, we let's just say that we uh, are going to have only one owner for now. And, and, at first, maybe we maybe we have an owner, maybe we don't, because if we have an owner, the um, it, it means the car is no longer owned by the dealership, and if we don't have an owner, it's, it's still owned by the dealership or something like that. And now we want to no longer have optional fields and, and make everything required. Uh, so how would that look? Uh, string owner uh, is four, and uh, oh, forgot to put the type. Compile the proto. Uh, this should break the app. Uh, good, it's broken. So let's uh, let's read the. We're going to you know, make Obi Wan the owner of the car again because Obi Wan is uh, everyone's favorite Jedi. The owner of the car is new car get owner. And note that we changed this from a, a non optional field to an optional field from car to car v two. We would expect that it would work and, and we should get Obi-Wan as the owner. What happens? The owner is Obi-Wan, right? So now what if we don't set this? I think we're going to get empty string and a silent failure, which is kind of confusing. But uh, that is important to note because in an optional field, if it's not present, it just is not set. And that is the same thing as uh, when you set a, a, a zero value. 
Now, the, if we go the other way and we go from making it a required string to optional, that is quite fun uh, because uh, remember that protobuf is in an optimization effort. If you set something to the zero value, it does not actually get set. So we'll go back here, um, compile. And well, we set the set the owner to Obi-Wan. We're going to read it again. We, we would expect, of course, that the owner is, is still uh, present. Now, here's an interesting thing. What happens if we set the owner to the empty string? And here, we're going to uh, print out whether the owner is present. Recall that when you make a field optional, it gives you a has field name uh, method, which tells you whether the field was set or not. Here, we explicitly set the field to the empty string. And recall that it is a non-optional field. Um, but here, it is an optional field right here in the, the new version of the car. So when we read it, we, we expect that uh, the protobuf will expect that if it was set, then there would be a, a value present. So let's run it and see what happens. It says the owner was not set. Why is that? That's because as an optimization, when a field is not optional, if you write the empty string or the zero value of that field type to the field, protobuf will not serialize it. And then when you read it in option, when you read it and expect the field to be optional, protobuf expects that if the field was set, there will be a value containing the empty string or a non-empty string. And if the field was not set, then it is empty. So that is one thing you need to keep in track, keep in mind when you move a field from required to optional is that anything set to the zero value will be treated as null, no longer treated as zero. So that's one thing that breaks if you change from a non-optional to an optional field. So there's a, a couple of fun things that you can do uh, to prove and, and, and look at verifying what happens when you change the schemas for, for your protocol buffer objects. But I'd like to wrap this up um, right about now with, with a, you know, a couple of final words. So in, in summary, protobuf is a library for serialization, which means the ability to write data from memory or from a, a Java object or Python object or something into a series of bytes that can be read by some other program somewhere. Very high performance with code generation in multiple languages and schema evolution capabilities, which we've talked about. So there's a couple things that you can do with protobuf beyond this. For example, uh, gRPC, uh, Google RPC is, is a framework built around automatically generating the stub for a server that sends protobuf messages back and forth and generating clients that allow you to make calls to uh, those uh, those services very easily. And Little Horse uses gRPC extensively. Uh, most of the Little Horse clients are actually uh, gener automatically generated gRPC code. And I, I want to do a talk on that in the future about how a little horse uses gRPC, some of the fancy things you can do with, with gRPC bidirectional streaming, where one client will open up a long lived connection to a server and they can exchange messages back and forth. That is actually how little horse task workers work. It's a very cool technology, very high performance, and it, it avoids the need for having to make a bunch of HTTP 1.1 polling requests asking for tasks. So that's one of the ways that little horse gets such high performance is by leveraging bidirectional streaming of gRPC. Um, so that, those are some things we can talk about in the future. Uh, also wanted to make a quick plug because uh, my dad's on the call and he's Little Horse uh, advisor and, and investor. And if he, uh, if I didn't make, didn't say something about Little Horse, I'd probably get in trouble. So we just made, just made a very big release, Little Horse 0 0.7. It's, it's the first we're calling production ready Little Horse release. And in that we are now committing ourselves to what we just talked about, which is schema evolution and compatibility. In the past, we were in the developer phase, didn't have users yet. So we were changing the API and, and not paying attention to how to evolve it such that existing clients didn't break. But now we're at the point where we have some early users. And because of that, uh, compatibility is incredibly important to us. Stability is incredibly important. And 0 0.7 is the first production ready release. We're moving to 1.0. We're going to release 1.0 very, very soon. Um, which is going to be the first version commi committed to semantic versioning. And, and we'll, that will be a long-term support release with, with patch fixes for, for 12 months. Um, you can find us on, you, you know how to reach me if you want to try out Little Horse, talk about Little Horse or something. Send me a message on LinkedIn, uh, visit our website. We have a bunch of quick starts and such. Anyways, uh, thanks for your time. Um, I will pause if there's any questions about protocol buffers. I didn't see anything in the chat, but 
I appreciate you guys coming. So don't see any questions right now. So I guess we'll, we'll uh, call it a day. Thanks everyone for coming. Appreciate it.